It's my distinct privilege to introduce Krista Tippett, the author of many books and the host of On Being, the curator of the, uh, and I apologize. Civil Conversations Project. Civil Project. Conversation <laughs> Projects and the founder of the On Being Project. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so happy to be here. We've, we've wanted to come to this forum, and this is the year it was possible. And to be here with Darnell Moore is really exciting. So I'm just going to jump in. Um, we will we'll be in conversation up here about 35, 40 minutes. I'll invite you at that point, if you have questions, to hand them wherever people are showing you to hand them. And then we will do a bit of a back and forth, open the conversation up to the room. And then we'll come back up here for the last five to 10 minutes, because we're doing this for radio. Um, so I'm just going to leap right in. I want to say this is a very beautiful book, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. Um, highly recommended. Darnell, you know, I, um, I start most of my conversations with a question about the spiritual or religious background of someone's childhood, however they would describe that. And that can mean so much more than religious formation. It can be what was happening with your body and spirit. And as I read um, your book in particular, there's a word you use a lot, which is a, kind of a magnetic and surprising word, which is magic. And I feel like when you talk about magic, you're, you're talking about the, like the human spirit. Or I, I, I want to just draw you out on that. I mean, one way... It's going to come up as we keep talking, the different contexts in which you use that word. But, you know, you talk about the everyday, ordinary magicians who learn to create life among death-dealing cultures of hatred and lies. So what, what is that magic as you've experienced it in your life? Um, well, first, it's, it's magic to be sitting in conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's so funny when you when you say that the first the first sort of image that comes to my mind is um, the black family I grew up around, mm. uh, a, a people who lacked, according to all standards, um, a type of wealth. Yeah, they didn't have a lot of money, but they were in possession of a lot of love and care. And um, if I knew nothing else, I knew that the people around me, even though media and and the sort of larger world tended to characterize the people who I called family, the place that I called home as like the ghetto, as the hood, mm. as almost lacking virtue. Um, here were people that sort of like made something out of nothing. Um, I talked to somebody earlier and said like it's the type of family where you would look in the cupboards and like as a child I didn't see any, I'm like, I didn't see any food. How did they make this full dinner? Mm. Um, but they sort of made something out of nothing. All that to say, that's how I sort of lived my life. I lived my life as a sort of dreamer, um, always thinking about how I would and could um, pull from whatever sort of resources or love that I had um, to make something of a life. How does one come to love oneself in, in the face of, of hatred? How does one come to love oneself as a queer person when the world is telling this queer person that to be queer is to be wrong? How does one come to love oneself as a black queer person when the world is telling this black queer person that their blackness is to be um, to be hated? And as a young person, I, I would and you talk about spirit. I would go into the bathroom. This is a true story. And reading the Bible at nine, hmm. and the newspaper, <laughs> um, and I would talk to God like I'm talking to you. And, um, and I would be talking to God about these problems at nine years old. And I would be saying things like, I want all A's on my report card and then go to school. I would literally pray, God, I want all A's on my report card. And then go to school um, and work my tail off. And I would pray, God, I want this violence to stop in my house. Um, or, you know, at nine, trying to figure out what it meant to sort of to, to, to survive when I, when in so many ways, you know, children shouldn't be thinking about not being here at nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, but coming into, and I, I call queerness magic. Yeah. Yeah. It's the another not, phase of that, another, yeah. another form of that magic. The not yet here is what, I, that's what, how Jose Muniz defines that. Um, 
So I think I had a really magical childhood. And, and I would say, yeah, and I didn't grow up in the church proper as a young person. Um, but what I did know, um, I did have access to like the expansiveness that is spirit, mm -hmm. that is love. Um, you start your book um, with, uh, it, yeah, I was talking, talking about another, another use of the word magic, you know, child, the childlike magic. And you, you focus that, we, we see a picture of you, um, a picture of your face, and in which that phrase is absolutely, comes to life, right? Is evident. Um, and what you, and you, you, you wrote, um, it took years before I realized the image in my mama's picture was beautiful. With skin too brown, big lips, and a wide nose, I often turned away from my reflection. As I grew up, there were invisible forces moving about like ghosted hands. A hand would touch my cheek and steer my head and eyes away from the mirror. It was unseen but felt, and it needed to be named. Um, I feel like that's um, such an apt image for this moment we inhabit together, where there's this naming of things um, that have been true, but many of us could turn away from them and even make others turn away from themselves. Um, I, you know, I've been thinking about this moment. You know, we're a culture that's been taught to, to lie and to love lies. Um, we, you know, we come from nation states, many of which will doubt them, tell themselves as democratic, as just, um, and, and by virtue of their histories proves to be very opposite that, a but, story, but we, yeah. we sort of tout that nonetheless. Um, we are, I think within a sort of moment that is asking of us, are, are, are so many of us are pointing fingers at the big monsters in the room, um, whether that's within, um, a range of movements that are centered on. Uh, rape culture and sexual assault or, or racism and such, but no one really ever take the time to think about what it might mean to, to point the finger back itself and, and examine the, monst the monstrosities within us. Um, to, so self-reflexivity, self-reflection, mm -hmm. honest reckoning is something that we do not like. Um, a big part of my, my writing in the book was I really wanted to model, um, and not be, even beyond modeling, I just wanted to be honest and say, like, it's going to be impossible for me to talk about my dad and all the things that he did and, and all the ways in which he showed up as a monster in my life are the world, are homophobes. And your, your dad was in and out of jail. He was. And, and he was a person who could be incredibly loving and tender to you and also could hurt your mother. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and I tried to write about him in a complex way, but I also realized that um, to t the turn to self and my need to also think through the ways that he, he and I were shaped by the same sort of forces was really critical. Mm. It was really healing for me. The reason why I was able to forgive him for all that he, I, I observed and witnessed him doing um, is because I finally realized, when I, when I realized that the distance that I thought we that existed between us, the moral distance, <laughs> yeah, was quite short. Um, like him, you know, I, I didn't know, you know, I didn't physically abuse girls and women in my life, um, but I certainly was privileged to go out into the world and be free because I was the oldest boy. Um, I was never questioned about things that I wanted to do in life or in my, you know, in ways that say my sisters were. Um, and I kept thinking, oh, so I benefited from patriarchy, these words we like to use, yeah. Mm -hmm. I benefited from this sort of position of like malness um, in the same ways that he did. And it, it's just really important, I think, for me. For, it was important. It is important for me to reckon with self. But isn't that how we get to sort of transformation? Yes. And what feels important to me, too, is even when you, when you begin with the picture of you as this beautiful, beaming child. Thank you. you yeah. <laughs> you're still, and you're still beautiful. Um, you, this picture of you is, you, you, your quest for this, for self-knowledge, for justice, for us to tell the truth and, 
and free ourselves from the cages these lies have put us in is about recovering joy. Mm. Right? You want to recover that smile you had on your face as your birthright, and actually as all of our birthright. You know, it's so funny. I was, um, I had gotten so used to, uh, to believing that my childhood lacked smiles. Mm. Because that's what trauma does, you know? Um, it, it was sort of the smiles were overshadowed by a lot of the violences that I witnessed. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me until I started looking at pictures. So in my mind, like, I just could not remember myself as a seven-year-old kid on a big wheel with, like, socks up to my knees, um, playing with, like, making dirt sandwiches and mud pies and all this stuff uh, with a big smile on my face until I looked at the pictures and <laughs> I started laughing. Um, because I'm like, oh, I did smile. And then it made me think, how, how, how did that little boy um, find a smile? Maybe the day after watching his mom being brutalized by his father, right? Or how, how does uh, did a 14 year old get up and, and find a smile um, after being called names by friends or, or being attacked by friends? Um, and it reminded me of the power that's, and this is what I mean by magic again, hmm. um, what it means to summon strength from within oneself um, in spite of what's going on, um, what it means to like be alive and, and making life possible and dancing and sweating and enjoying the company of others, even as the fire is burning, hmm. um, which is not to say, which is not to, to minimize the fires that burn in our lives. No, but it's, in some ways, we have to take seriously and keep walking towards that joy to stay alive, right? To stay whole, to come yeah. out the other side whole. Um, Camden, New Jersey is also very much a character in your story. Um, it's a place, you were reborn there, right? Yes. You grew up there. Yes. Um, it was Walt Whitman's in Invincible City. And when you were growing up, it was a place that journalists would call the most dangerous city in America. Um, you say the city literally was on fire in 1971. Do you want to tell that story? And you were born five years later, you say, when it was still smoldering. Yeah, and what I, what I will say is that um, I, I was told very early on, I was, I was taught that, you know, the, 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 the sort of talk in the street was a, the Camden used to be a very prosperous industrial city. Um, until, you know, the people rioted and burned it down. That's what you're told. So you're led to believe that black and Latinx people just went out and just burned stuff down because, you know, they just were angry because that's what black and Latinx people do. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's what you're told. Um, but no one ever told me the reason why there was an up uh, uprising. Um, the reason why there was an uprising, it's because um, law enforcement, two white men, um, stopped a Puerto Rican um, person who was driving his car he was in his early 30s. And um, Horacio Jimenez, um, Horacio Jimenez was stopped for uh, a traffic stop and never made it home, would not make it home because he was killed. Um, he was beat up badly, ended up dying a few weeks later in the hospital. So that said, it was interesting sort of a uh, way that we revise history. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I, I had let, I was led to believe that, you know, these sort of lawless, reckless folk of color um, just took to the street and burned things down because they were just, you know. Really, really. So you, that's, you really had no idea what I did not. inside of that. I didn't. I, I mean, I sensed it. Mm -hmm. um, I sensed that the, I, I had, I, what I did have an understanding of was that there was, um, you know, what happened, my, my family would tell me stories about placing red, black, and green flags on the outside of their home, which was a signal to people who were um, sort of rising up that this was a home you would leave alone. It was black people's um, sort of sign of solidarity with the Puerto Ricans and the community. So I sensed early on it just had some racial dynamics. The two white officers were white that killed, and the, the, the majority of the police force at the time was white. Um, all that to say, like recovering that history reminded me that cities like Camden, uh, urban, post-industrial, predominantly black and Latinx, predominantly working poor cities do not come to be quote unquote ghettos and hood because of the people. Because you know mm -hmm. the people that are live there are somehow mm -hmm. pathological. They have long histories that we tend to not always tell fully. And um, you, you, you got out, right? You left, and 
and then came back. And I think you didn't originally come back because that's where you wanted to be. But then really coming back saved you. And you know, one thing that I feel that I think about so much in this moment we inhabit is the intersection of what is intimate, what is civilizational. Mm. And I think like you're a writer and you also know how strangely, mysteriously, the more personal you can be, the more vividly personal you can be, the more universal the story becomes. Yeah. But in this context, I think also this story of Camden, New Jersey is the story of cities all over our country and all over the world. Yes, it is. It seems to me, I want to talk about that too, because when you came back, you got involved in some, um, and this is a room full of social entrepreneurs, you know, really good efforts, but in which people were coming to save Ham Camden but kind of treating it like a faraway country that they were going to develop. Yeah, you know, I, so I would love, I would have loved to tell this, tell the story. Like, you know, I went back to Camden, like, fired up. Um, but I didn't, you know, I, I was hesitant to go home. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to return home, and you know, I ended up having to go back because nobody would hire me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I got to go back to Canada. Even though you did end up getting those great grades and I did get getting into good schools. Didn't and, matter. You yeah. know, I, um, I ended up home and I ended up living in a, a house as part of a, what was called an urban ministry um, with what they would call urban missionaries. And the 13 other people that lived in this home with me were all white all of whom had come from other states and other countries um, to the place that I was running from. The house, you'll be surprised to know, was literally about three to five minutes walking distance from my mom's house. And I was just like, God, this is like hilarious. Like, <laughs> you want to talk about a joke? I was raising my fist to the air. Like, how dare you? Like, not only are you sending me home, but I got to like, my mom live around the corner. Um, but it was such, I'm so grateful that that happened. I, I was making, you know, I, wasn't, I don't think that's called, that's not a wage, but we were paid a $30 a week, I think, mm. living allowance. Um, so this tells you, this, so if people are opting in to getting paid $30 a week, this tells you the type of, and I'm gonna use the word privilege, we, we sort of use that word and throw it around, but to make a choice like that, to fly into to Camden, to, to tells you the sort of worlds that people were coming from. And what I'll say is like, there was a type of sort of salvific guilt that often was at the, the hidden somewhere in this motivation. Um, and it's, it was interesting to explain, because on one hand, like these are folk who came and nobody, you know, you weren't making it. What yeah. are you getting besides $30? But there was this way that we would go out and do these, um, these ask at churches on like a Sunday, we would go to the church and we would talk about the city and not, people would be talking about the city as if it was um, this space <laughs> that I didn't come from, no. a, a space that I didn't know. And I felt woefully uncomfortable with the way that they were able to manipulate this sort of, uh, I, I, we call it trauma porn. Mm, yeah. Yeah, to get people to feel. And I'm all, I was thinking like, if I have to, go down a list in order, especially on a Sunday service, um, and, and lament about what else communities that we could, other, we might otherwise know what was happening about if we actually enter those communities <laughs> as, you know, if this is what it takes to get people to feel and therefore give money to this, to this urban ministry, then, then it showed a type of uh, a lack of true care to mm -hmm. me, um, and that bothered me. What What did you take out of that? <clears throat> you also later on, and I mean, this is a very different story, but it feels a little bit connected to me. You ended up working on um, this project that or it was funded by Mark Zuckerberg to 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 heal the schools in in Newark, and. Um, and I think, I mean, I think that was a complicated experience, like this other one. It wasn't all bad, and it wasn't all, it wasn't all stuff you would criticize. But what did you take out of those experiences about what you think really is needed to actually heal, to actually transform? Because none of those things you experienced did, didn't affect those, that. Yeah. Um, you know, what I will say is that those same folk, by the way, um, 
I, I felt so critiqued in that moment because these were the folk that were also providing like after school tutoring and activities to my cousins. Mm. Right. <laughs> right. So there's right. that on the one hand, but then there are sort of like the systemic challenges. You know, when I was working um, in Newark doing um, sort of school reform work in a project as part of a project that was largely funded by uh, the, the Facebook Zuckerberg money, uh, what I learned was that, you know, Sometimes what we imagine to be our good is not always our best, is not always great. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the good can be commoditized. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, we can turn the good into a, th you know. So um, there were so many lessons to ha to, that were learned from that particular experience. Namely, one, you know, any time that we're attempting to do community engagement work, and, I, and it's funny that we, we would call it community engagement work, are working on in community with, with vulnerable peoples and our groups who I like to say exist on the edges of the edges of the margins but refuse to center the very people you say you are in community with. Um, you know you're starting off in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. what are you, and what would that look like? So it looks like them, saying things like, you know, yeah. I, you know, it looks like before we go in with our, with uh, sort of become the architects of a plan to tell you what transformation looks like, I actually sit down with the people and ask them what it is that they need, mm -hmm. what it is that they desire, uh, what ails them, what 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 is their sort of their what is their freedom dream, as Robin Kelly would say. Um, and so many times, what we do, we fly into communities like all, out of these sort of helicopters of well, salvific helicopters with ideas and plans because you know we're social entrepreneurs um, and we, we have innov innovative things to do and we have used best practices <laughs> and we have tried and tested um, and evaluated and have evidence-based models. Y'all see where I'm going. Um, and then, you know, so therefore we can come into the community as quote unquote experts. That's what neoliberalism tells us. Neoliberalism is about the dissolution of community about the lifting up of the big I, the expert in the room, never about community building, and the reminder that expertise lies in every one of us, that we all have analyses. And I think what it looks like then is moving ourselves out of the way hmm. and creating space for everyone, particularly those we say that we're in community with, are working on behalf of, to do the dreaming, to be the architects of their own dreams, of their own transformation, of the worlds and communities in which they like to live, and then we, we, we journey along with them. Never ever commandeering a journey, hmm. which, is, which is what tends to happen. Um, did you know Vincent Harding before he died, the civil rights not. leader? But I, I, I knew you of know his of legacy, him? yeah. Yes. I kept thinking when I was reading you and thinking about this, of something he said to me, which I've never heard anybody saying quite this way, but you know he was a civil rights leader of a different generation, and you're you are you could be called a civil rights leader or freedom fighter of 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 this of the next generation of that movement. And he was talking about um, he actually took the the lessons of the civil rights movement into communities into to young people in hurting places. And like, what did we learn? What do we know? And he talked about um, experiencing, he was talking about being in conversation with a particular person, a young person, it, like many other young people operating in a situation <clears throat> where they felt it was just very, very dark all around them. And what they needed were, as he put it, some signposts, human lights, so live human signposts that would help them see the possibilities for themselves. And then he said this, I've always felt that one of the things that we do badly in our educational process, especially working with so-called marginalized young people, is that we educate them to figure out how quickly they can get out of the darkness and get into some much more pleasant situation, when what is needed again and again are more people like this, this man who was doing this program who will stand in that darkness, who will not run away from those deeply hurt communities, and will open up possibilities that other people can't see in any other way except seeing it in human beings who care for them. Mm. It reminded me of like, you know, I was telling you that I was running away from Camden. Yeah. Partially because I, you know, this- That's what we do in this country. You know, we run. We run. <laughs> um, you know, I, particularly because of this notion of, of 
these skewed notions of success or what success might mean or this American dream. But there is something to be said about um, sitting in discomfort and sitting within spaces of um, sitting in the darkness. Um, when I work, I did a lot of work and have done a lot of work with young people, particularly queer, transgender, non-conforming young people, many of whom were, were houseless. They did not have homes to go to. Um, some of whom had to make various choices about uh, and negotiate every single day about where they're going to stay and what they're going to do to be able to stay at those places. Um, all of this within this very sort of moment of like queer liberation and freedom, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so, so many times I, I wish I could sort of snap my finger um, and pull them out of sort of the, 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 the spaces of despair that some of them were in. And not all were in despair, by the way. Yeah. Um, so uh, the reason why I talk about queerness as magic is because when I look at the, the way that these young people maneuver through the world and survive, I, I, I see nothing but strength. Um, but we, we resist the uncomfortable conversations. I mean, to love is to not lie. So I go into a lot of places and, you know, folk are, <laughs> I'm very honest about racism. I'm very honest about like sexism and, and sometimes, you know, <laughs> I had a friend who once said, um, how do you walk in these rooms and say the stuff that you say to white people? <laughs> and I'm like, well, if, if, what, how are we going to heal mm -hmm. if we don't reckon with the truth? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want me to smile about racism and the fact that right now in the, in the present milieu, a white racist can walk into a black church and shoot nine people dead. If you want me to lie about sexism and misogyny and its effects, that people, even as we are talking right now, have no way, they can't negotiate out of rape or sex slavery or gender um, disparity in their jobs, right? Like, the last I checked, that's not funny. So all that to say, you know, sometimes I, you know, when I'm having these sort of conversations that I don't even think they are tough, I think that they are honest and they are signs of love. Mm -hmm. Folk don't want to be made comfortable. What? I don't understand how that is to how that can be. Um, well, I do understand, right? <laughs> I, I do understand how that can, how we how we resist um, discomfort. But what I do know is that we can only get to quote unquote light if we are willing to work so hard to travel through the darkness. Right, right. It's, there's, a, there's a way in which you could say it's intuitive to resist discomfort, but, but we can, but it could be a muscle we flex it to get work. stronger. Right, as you say, it's work. It's work. I mean, I was writing in a book and, you know, I'm like, I was really honest about my, my, my errors <laughs> and my own stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't think I wanted to withhold that? You don't, you don't think I wanted to sort of paint? A, I would, I'm, look, I'm the author of a memoir. I can totally write myself in this book any way I wanted to. <laughs> and I often sat down and was like, damn, you know? Like, yeah. But I had to work at um, sort of girding my strength and sitting down and going, you know, you, you have a choice here um, to offer something that is closer to honest. Uh, that is that is more in line with with the love that is that is that you're trying to sort of portray on a page, or you can lie. Mm -hmm. And your point, the context for you of love, and your point that that in fact to be honest is an act of love, and the opposite is not. Um, you come back a lot to love in the book, and I feel I hear the word love really rising up, really surfacing societally. And, and yet, uh, it's, it's, also, it's also a ruined word yes. culturally. So, so as, as those of us who want to use that word, I mean, it's, it's a very muscular, fierce, it, it holds all the complexity um, in the way you use the word and the way I'm finding really, really fantastic people using the word. It holds all the complexity that life does. And in fact, that love does when we... All of our experience of love is complex. It's funny because then, but when you use it politically, it sounds like a soft option. <laughs> um, it's the hardest thing in life, right? Um, but you said, I want to just. There was a moment. So in the when you were working on, you wanted you were you were working on creating a charter school as part of that renewal of the school system. 
in Newark, and it was you were designing this Sakia Gun School for Civic Engagement, 2010, which was, um, and she was a young woman who was lesbian mm -hmm. and died. She was murdered. She was murdered. Um, and that project didn't work. Um, and you described this moment where it was a meeting where people were weighing in on it and talking about it was just another form of segregation is what you were talking about, or they were against gay schools. And you talked about how that, being in that meeting surfaced all of your personal drama with this, all of your personal hurt, and yet your hurt was far from personal. And the thought you had in that moment, and I want you to talk to us about this thought, is Americans travel so quickly to the edges of our love. Uh, it's so, you know, I forgot I wrote that sentence. <laughs> um, it, it, that was a, you know, and, and, and it's important to just for me to say Sakia Gunn's name. Uh, it, she, in her life, um, I didn't have the, the fortune to, to know her, but certainly her death catalyzed a, a localized movement in Newark, New Jersey. She was murdered at 15 by a 28-year-old 20, man because she rejected his advances. She was a black, lesbian, AG, what they call aggressive, um, identified girl. Um, and it's important just to name her. Um, the school was a part of a new plan that was to be, that was being um, fleshed out in Newark, a, a bunch of new traditional public schools that were organized around certain themes. And this, the theme of the school was such, sort of civic engagement, really helping students to think about social justice. And some of the, um, not some, but a lot of the, the residents pushed back against the idea because they had thought that we were trying to create a school solely for um, LGBTQIA students, which as you know, as a public school, that's impossible. Just because it was named after her. You know, I mean, that, yeah. Um, uh -huh. But what was interesting about it is that some of the people in that room had I had been in, in organizing with in other capacities. You know, we would do anti-violence marches, and um, we would be calling out, uh, you know, Cory Booker, <laughs> who I worked with, um, as a chair of his LGBTQI concerns advisory committee. Um, and we had, you know, and I had saw them. I've seen I was with them in other spaces, but this particular moment, um, you know, the the love that had been extended to the least of th those within our community seem to have stopped right there. Okay. Um, so I, I, the way that I describe it is, you know, I, I've been in, for instance, part of uh, marches for like movement for black lives and people out here and that we're all like organizing and raising our fists and we're going in and we got black, love, black Lives Matter shirts on. And I remember being told when I had, when we talked about remembering that trans women, trans women of colors, are dying and we should be marching on their behalf if we can march. Marching on their behalf too. Someone saying to me, that's not, why are you distracting us from our work? Or me being at the Pride March in um, queer New York City. It's queer as it's supposed to be. Um, and this is just a year and a, like a year and a half ago. And, um, and we're out there having a rainbow good of a time until the Black Lives Matter protesters come and disrupt the march. And all of the happy folk who are here with me in our pride outfits are upset mm -hmm. because now the Black Lives Matter folk are distracting from the real work of pride. What I'm trying to get at. The, those are the edges of our love. The edges. Mm -hmm. The very limited ways that our sort of politics are organized around self-interested desires only. Mm -hmm. The things that touch us at our homes, quote unquote, but never ever the other stuff. As if a Black Lives Matter march is not a queer as a queer project. As if Sakia's life as a queer person is not a pal is not also a part of what it means to, to fight for black liberation. Um, and, and so we, we do, we stop like the, right there, which is why I, don't, I, I like to be very clear that when I'm talking about love, I'm talking about costly love, not cheap hallmarkish love, mm -hmm. the way that we've come to imagine it. It was King say strong demanding love. Yeah. I want to talk for a few minutes. Oh, so this is, well, we're almost at the 40 minute mark. So if you have questions, um, go ahead and hand the cards in and I'm sure someone will pick them up. <laughs> um, 
I want to talk about Black Lives Matter. Hmm. Um, I don't know, I just think one thing that I, uh, you're, you're a journalist, that's one of, one of the hats you wear. Media, journalism in this country has not really covered Black Lives Matter, mm. I don't think. I mean, and I think it's partly, well, there are probably many, many reasons, some of which are the reasons Black Lives Matter needed to begin in the first place, but some of it is because it doesn't look like a movement the way that has been defined, right? And so when there's a march or a protest, that gets covered. Mm-hmm. But you said, um, but this is a whole completely different kind of thing. Um, you said, uh, and I'll just, well, let's just do a little bit of, well, let me, let me uh, you, you said Black Lives Matter, this is how you defined it, is a radical social intervention. Mm. Um, <clears throat> And it takes courage to stage a public disruption or act of civil disobedience. But often that is the only type of work the public might see. And the public also might only see that because that's the only thing journalists will cover, I'm adding that. The harder work, though, is that which occurs before and after public works of protest. It also takes tenacity to do all this work without being bought by political machines or donors. So there's a way in which I feel like we haven't even really started telling ourselves the story of Black Lives Matter the way 100 years from now somebody will tell it. And they probably may not remember what a hashtag is, <laughs> but they may note that it was started by three women and two of them were queer, right? So I'm just, I wonder if you would just talk about your experience, like what that movement or social intervention has mean, meant to you, how you got into it, <clears throat> and how you see its ongoing force in our world? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the question. The movement for black lives, or what some refer to as Black Lives Matter is, um, it's a, it, it represents a constellation of groups, including the Black Lives Matter Global Networks and several others like the Dream, Dream Defenders and Black Youth Project and, and Song um, and dot, dot, dot. I want to always talk about this particular movement as part of a long history of of black struggle um, within the context of the U.S. I don't see it as separate from, um, but a a continuation of, a part of a genealogy, an iteration of a movement. What was really, really key is that, you know, a couple things. You have a, some folk who have been involved in this iteration who I, I can remember being, you know, in, in conversations where we we're, were very forthright about ensuring that the typical things like black, cisgender, male, charismatic leaders are not solely lifted up as the folk that um, we are ought to sort of listen to. And I'm bringing that up because that is what media was searching for. Exactly. That charismatic leader. Everybody was like, well, yeah. who's the leader? Yeah. And, you know, we wanted him to look like Martin Luther King. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, because this is what we have somehow been led to believe that sort of movements ought to look like. But here you have this sort of decentralized, or not even really decentralized, but a, what, what, what folks had called a leaderful movement that was um, about that represented folk who weren't that. I mean, these were women, yeah. um, cisgender and transgender women, queer yeah. Yeah. women, um, folk who were not walking around in suits but had their pants sagging, um, folk who were not preaching behind a pulpit but, but, but who might have been on a corner of their neighborhoods. And it represented something very different in ways that sort of elided the American sort of way that we come to think about movements, which was its beauty. Mm-hmm. Which was its beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also, so we talk about that. We talk about what I call the spectacular, the spectacularities of like of movement building, the stuff that you get to see, the stuff that people want to report about. But what folk don't see are the ways that communities are built, and and sort of uh, what what you know the stuff that's happening outside of the camera. It looks like folk showing up for each other, um, and making sure like and putting money together to make sure that some of these organizers are getting um, therapeutic interventions 
for the traumas that they're experiencing. It looks like when the same folk that we lift up and we follow on Twitter and we put on a cover of our magazines, who we glamorize because they, they may now become somebody that become a spectacle within the media, um, may not have money to pay their rent, may not even have a place to lay their head, may not even have food. It looks like people coming up with means so that that person can eat. Um, it looks like everyday struggle, not the spectacular stuff, not the stuff when the cameras are there. But what do you do when the everyday quote unquote microaggressions that we may ignore are eating you alive and you need you know, support? It looks like when my father died, I didn't ask the Black Lives Matter New York chapter to come, but I turned, they, they found their way to Camden. And when I'm burying my father, I look over and you have a whole chapter of people who have become family who have come from various parts of the country who showed up. That's the stuff that we didn't miss, the spiritual elements of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've said that this... Remember you, when you're writing about... So for you, this started with Michael Brown and Ferguson and driving almost a thousand miles and being part of working with Patrice Cullors to create a... I don't know, what did you all call that? Just it was like a, a, a freedom ride of Yeah, sorts. a freedom ride. And so people converging from all parts yeah. of the country. Um, yeah, and we you... We brought 500 people, 500 people plus came um, that weekend, and this precipitated what would be the development of the Black Lives Matter Global Network. So those folk, you know, were encouraged to think about not only Ferguson, but the other Fergusons, that is the homes that they were going to go back to yeah. and how they could take that energy back. So that really catalyzed um, the development of what is now the BLM network. And um, to be part of that development process was, um, was life changing in, in so many ways. Uh, you know, we, we did not intend um, when we were trying to get people over the course of two weeks to, to travel across the country and show up together as a caravan to support the folk in Ferguson. I should name here that we didn't just, people didn't just show up there. We actually worked um, over the course of that two weeks to ask folk there what it is, they de what it is that they needed, if they even wanted us to come. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, so many of us were changed um, for that. And, and I think, you know, the culture was changed for that. You did say, um, you did write, um, what I wish I could adequ adequately detail, though, is the spiritual undercurrent and here we go, the radical black love that flowed that weekend. And I also, I feel also that's not part of the story. That's not as, that's not vivid on the answer, right? Because it also gets covered as a political movement with a, with a very clinical, technocratic 20th century lens yeah. on what a political movement is about. It's so true. I'm laughing. I mean, you see me smiling because you, I forgot that I said radical black love. And I was once in conversation with Bell Hooks. And she said, what do you mean black love? Isn't it? It's love. Love is love. <laughs> and I said, no, black love. <laughs> and I, I told her I had to modify that um, precisely because for black people within the country who said that it loved all people, <laughs> to think about love as anything um, that is not politicized for some um, is to lie. So I say black love because I know what it means to be to to for, to exist in a space in a nation state that espouses love, um, and says it says it loves black people, but its history attests to something very different. Um, black love to me, and I, I talk about this in the book, is exampled by my family. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I write about them, um, you know, our house being always packed and always full and people laying on couches and going to sleep on floors and three to four in a bedroom and everybody like at a table, play cousins, people I never met before who became cousins. Um, but the, the idea was anyone who ever showed up at our door, who knocked on the door and was in need, my people let them in. They never disposed of folk. And I kept thinking that is the formation of a type of politics and a way of being in a world that if we practice that, think about if our policies were organized around that type of love, a type of love that demanded non-disposability, a type of love that demanded that I'm going to let you in, even if it means my discomfort, even if it means I'm going to get off my comfy bed and sleep on the floor so that these other three folk can have a bed to sleep in. Um, and that's what radical black love mean. And that is really what was at the heart of this movement. It was a movement that once said, no, 
anyone who's existing on the underside of power, who knows what it is like to be a violated and to be the center of violence, this movement is about it's representing and, and speaking your name. It's about pushing back against anti-blackness, yes, but anti-blackness no longer just means pushing it back against racism. Mm -hmm. It means an ending to sexism. It means an ending to misogyny and all of the consequences of patriarchy and imperialism and, and why, xenophobia. Why does it mean all those things? Because it must. It must because all of those, you know, we, when we say, you know, we always say when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, we're talking about all black lives and all aspects of black people's lives. And to talk about lives without attending to all of those things is to do a job that is not just. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's um, let's open this up. Liliana Maria Percy Ruiz, our executive producer. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I will not even try to read people's names because I don't want to butcher them. But just know that I so appreciate your questions. Um, the first question um, for Donnell is. In our African region, we have many children who are growing up in an environment that seeks quick gains in numbers, ignoring the critical social, emotional, and mental well-being. And yet social, emotional, and mental well-being are elements for overcoming all these adversities and darknesses. What can we do to help philanthropies realize the value of social, emotional, and mental well-being in the social entrepreneur work? Um, it's such a good question, and I'm certain that there are many people here who have been tackling that head on. Um, but I, I, I keep one. I just want to lift up Edgar um, Villanueva's work, um, but also say something about what it means to attend to the whole persons and the whole communities when we're doing our work and not just parts of people. Um, that any intervention that isn't thinking through how we can um, be responsive to all aspects of, uh, of people in our communities, I don't think are, are, um, are, will be wholly transformative. Um, I've been in, you know, on the side of many conversations, grant-making conversations, where um, our interventions are like clearly, clearly connected to, to types of outcomes, very specific <laughs> outcomes, that are really responding to the needs of the philanthropic community. Mm -hmm their investment interests, which is quite different, right, than um, organizing funding and, and philanthropic, like philanthropic interventions <laughs> around something different, and which I think should be central, right? Like the needs of the whole persons, the whole communities in which we're trying to impact. That's a great question. Uh, another question for you, Darnell. Some of us have come from privilege and excess of resources. What truths would you leave us with to inform how we live and work? It's another great question. Um, a friend of mine and a scholar, writer, Amani Perry, she has, um, over the last few years, have, have encouraged me and so many of us to think about privilege as a term that we use and what we really mean when we use that term. Um, so she's always asking that we unpack that. So when we talk about privilege, we're probably talking about a range of things, um, our access our, our proximity to safety, mm -hmm. um, our proximity to resources, of various forms of capital. We should be really specific um, with regards to that. And I think once we sort of uh, do that self-reflexive work of specificity, um, figure out what those sort of access points are, um, reckon with it. So, you know, I say this every, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, and I won't stop. Maybe this is gonna be on my tombstone. Um, but I often tell people that in, within the context that we are in now, we are very, very good at naming whose feet are on our necks. But we're really not really good at naming whose necks our feet are on. That second part is what I'm getting at when I'm talking about self-reflexivity. That's the message that I will leave. Figure out whose necks your feet are on. But guess what the harder and third part of the work is? Once you figure that out, guess what you need to do? Take your feet off. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I call material equity. Not the type of equity that's poetic and cute that we like to talk about. But if you really are self-reflexive and you really are about that work life, transformative justice, you would do the, the, the really hard work of removing your feet 
um, off somebody's neck. I, I think that's what I would leave. I also find in your in your own work and writing, you you're, you apply that reflection to yourself. That's that none of us are exempt, or most there's few of us. Yeah, and are I, exempt I, from that kind and of. And it's reflection. hard work. You know, and I, I should thank you for naming that because I'm, what I'm saying is not something that I don't follow, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something I try to practice um, in my everyday life. It means that I, I, I really do think about how I come to exist in the world, um, positions that I'm afforded, the, the life literally that I'm often afforded um, and reflecting on what I need to do, um, how I need to reckon with that and then sort of also commit to, to change. Mm -hmm. That's hard work. Yeah. Just two more questions. What does the feminist movement mean to you? Oh, the feminist movement, um, what does it mean to me? So let me just, let me just I, I'm a big believer in just giving, sort of celebrating the people who have made, whose lives have made mine possible. I am only alive today, and I mean that, um, because of black feminists in my life who taught me um, not only how to sort of think about the world and the ways that many of us live in the world are impacted, but who really helped me to love myself. Um, oh man, I mean, I've, I've taught all of my political lessons. I've been politicized and, and, and have a conscience because of feminist. Um, but what it means to me, feminism, I believe, you know, we talk about magic. It is sort of a political tool, an analysis, a way of being, a way of life, a practice that literally could change the world. That literally can change the world. And, and what I mean by feminism, I'm thinking about folk like, I'll say some names, the Kambahi River Collective, um, Barbara Smith, Cheryl Clark, June Jordan, Audre Lorde. And if we don't know those names, we should read them. Mm -hmm because they were principal architects. I mean, I think they're, they're writing about things that if we applied them in our everyday work, <laughs> what they're teaching us, they taught us things like, you know, simultaneity of oppressions. This is before intersectionality coined by Kimberly Crenshaw comes into being, or double jeopardy. So what they're wrestling with are the various ways that people's accesses, access points to power are denials the, the sort of the the the, th the ways that power is denied to them can be complicated because of the various ways they show up in the world. They've been thinking this stuff for I mean, you know like it's a feminist like you know Anna Julia Cooper. I can go back years. Who says things like we need to be more thoughtful about what justice means? Justice isn't only about giving men, <laughs> mm. you know, power, and if they're you know black men power so that they can be in equal standing with white men. It's about ensuring that all people have access to quote unquote shared power. And then black feminists, feminists come along and, and women of color feminists come along and say, you can't just think about the universal quote unquote woman. Not all the women are white. That's, you remember this work? Uh, you know, not, not, not all the women are straight. Not all the women are cisgender. Not all the women are able-bodied. What they're doing is teaching us how to think through particularities and how we can never ever dismiss particularities, our people's particular lived experiences, and hide those under the quote of some imagined universal. Because when you do that, when you get to the particulars, what I like to say, if you can figure out how to make sure that the person who exists on the edges of the edges of the margins can get free, by default, everybody else will be free too. If that isn't a political vision for world we make, and I don't know what is, and that's a feminist vision and I'm grateful for it. They taught me what self-reflexivity is. Um, so I, yeah, I just, you, you can tell I wear like feminist with a big F on a shirt, you know? <laughs> but you know, I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And last question, one that I really appreciate, so thank you whoever asked this. How do you take care of yourself on the toughest days? As a queer person of color, <laughs> every day, of our existence as a queer person of color can be an act of resistance. Some days are more challenging than others. How do you take care of yourself? Thank you for the question, and that's a wonderful way to end. Uh, we were talking earlier. <laughs> <laughs> About not being very good at that. <laughs> and having that in common. <laughs> yep. And I was, Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's hard, hard, hard work that I have had to learn to do, um, partially because... Um, 
you know, I'm an Aquarius, so I don't know if there's an Aquarius in the room, but we're like, you know, such altruistic people. Like we're of the world. We got to save the world. Um, so there's that. And, you know, I come from a type of world where a family of people who we just don't know how to say no, you know, um, even when we probably should. Um, like literally like I had, you know, if we have 10 cent left and somebody comes along and say, I need seven cent, we're like, take it. Cause that what you feel you're supposed to do. Um, I remember, I remember telling someone I used to go broke to get to conferences, for example, hmm. social justice conferences, nonetheless, <laughs> that were not economically just. Right. Okay. Like I would go broke to travel to conferences because, you know, this is what I'm called to do. And not no, people not knowing, I was, you know, would get up here and, and work in communities and, and, and people would walk away clapping and standing up and I would go home with not, not having any money for food to eat. Um, so that being said, I've had to learn to, one, um, create boundaries um, in my life to know that the work of dismantling all that might befall a black, queer, transgender, nonconforming person in the world is certainly and should never be black, queer, transgender, and non gender nonconforming people to do, um, to do alone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. Uh, you know, so like anti racism, like next workshop, I, I felt like I was, or when I get invited to Black History Month events, <laughs> it's so funny. I'm like, don't invite me to another black. That's like my month to sleep. You know, right. go get, you want to talk <laughs> right. about racism, yeah. go find some white, well, you know, person. Anyway, you get my point. <laughs> yeah. So learning to say no and being, being okay uh, with, and reminding myself that none of us show up as superheroes. And there's just these sort of logics that travel around now, like black girl magic and black men smile, like these hashtags that I think dehumanize us because I always say we should not have to be that damn magical in order to be one, legible, and, and, and they're two, you know, you know, celebrated, or three, alive. Mm -hmm. um, I, why can't we just be human? And humans need rest. And humans need to be reminded of their capacities to, to live. And, and to, humans need to be able to look in mirrors if they can see um, and, and take time to, to, to sit with themselves and their reflections. And I try to do that as much as I can. And I often do. We'll look in the mirror sometimes and remind myself to love everything that the world has taught me to hate. And don't turn my head until I've fallen in love with that thing. Um, and that's got me a, a long way. Last thing, I keep myself surrounded by people that really care for my soul. And that's super important. Hmm. Thank you. I had, um, that question made me think of a passage in your book that I'd marked for maybe reading. Let me just look at it, but it may not be right for where we are. But just, you, 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 um, you went through, I mean, this, this, you've, you've gone through really hard times. You went through 20 hard years. Um, mm -hmm. you, you made a suicide attempt, and it had, it had to do with sexual identity or uh, sexual orientation and, that, and identity, but not just that. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't know. I, I'm going to read this just because I, I think it's such an amazing description of depression, which is also too simple a word. Um, there were many days I moved through the streets under a haze. I would walk as if in a trance, seeing no one and ev seeing no one and everything. The brightest, sunniest days were dark, and I would feel nothing and everything at once. I wanted to feel the sun's warmth on my face and be overcome by the light, but life felt cold and appeared dark. The run was endless. My body and mind were exhausted because I could never grab hold of the light. I now wonder how many black boys and men walk under dark clouds every day, hoping to, to appear closer to the stereotypical images of success and masculinity so many of us are taught to emulate. It wasn't that I was too weak to simply think differently or give a middle finger to hateful people. I wanted to die, which is to say, not live, which is to say, not have to be strong enough all the time to fight to exist, which is to say, fight at all, which is to say, I really want to live without having to fight so damn hard to exist. Hmm. 
Um, yeah, it's the first time I think, as, as, as just me, I'm like, I'm just watering my eyes are watering. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. Um, I don't think I've, I've not heard those. I, I've in all of the, I've done a lot of book talks. Um, we've never touched that passage. Um, so it's, it had an impact on me, on me hearing it just now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really also thoughtful, not only about the, the um, individual stakes, our, you know, how we are impacted as individuals uh, within the world. But I'm often think about the, the ways that we also are not allowed as a collective, as people, to wrestle with, um, to wrestle with our sadnesses, um, to be honest, even those of us who believe that we are to be so strong, um, especially those of us who show up in rooms like this. Mm -hmm. Um, when the reality is so many people um, suffer these everyday types of darknesses and so many suffer alone. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking about why it was important for me to write that because I needed someone to pick it up and to know that it is okay for us to not be okay. As simple as that. And that simple acknowledgement, I think, can be a doorway to healing for so many people, mm -hmm. um, so many. I, I agree with you also. I mean, that is, that's a diagnosis of, of our culture as well. I mean, I was just out in Silicon Valley for a few months, and there are people who look like they're at the pinnacle of success in all the ways we measure that, or that are living this way too. It's, it's really, it's this pathology. Um, I wonder, look at all these notes, all these things we didn't get to <laughs> for our next conversation someday. Yes. Um, I wonder if you would tell the story <clears throat> of, um, being with your father when he was dying, mm. and the last words you spoke over his body, he was unconscious, but you were with him. I, I, um, my, my father passed away while I was writing this book, and at 55, um, which is important to note, you know, a black, black man dying very early um, is a thing. <laughs> Um, and I often say he died of heart issues and both metaphorical and literal. Um, so, you know, you have a sense from what we talked about that our relationship was very strained. And, and I, um, growing up being, you know, I was like the only son, the oldest child. And there's a way that the only son, the oldest child <laughs> in this sort of patriarchal way of thinking, you know, dad dies, you better be ready to like take up the mantle. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say things like, if when he passes, like, what am I going to say at his funeral? I don't have anything nice to say, you know? <laughs> um, and then when, like, on, you know, as he is on his deathbed, um, it, when I found out that he was uh, literally uh, was rushed to the hospital and was transitioning, I raised, you know, again, I like raising my fist to God, and I raised my fist again, like, here he goes again. Like, he would leave before we finish our, you know, before we finish our business and, like, apologize. <laughs> so I'm, like, mad at my dad. Like, you going to just die? Like, that's what you're going to do? you just going to die, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you would just die, so we don't have to do the hard work. Okay, fine. But um, <laughs> I rushed home. I was, I was set to give a, a keynote, actually, in, um, in Miami and found out the news and, and, and it felt something I did not expect to feel. When the news came, I was about to, I was literally supposed to walk on stage and I rushed home, rushed home and got home on a flight and I was so disoriented and got to the hospital and he was unconscious and my sisters and I were surrounding him in his bed and I had like this transcendent moment mm. that actually like changed my life. Um, I was a different person on the other side of it. Um, and it seemed to me like we, you know, it was, here, there was no more time, like what more, we didn't need any more time to hold on to anger. The anger was gone. And it was the anger that had kept me from feeling, really. Um, the things that I needed to feel to move forward and to forgive all this time. And you know what happens when you, the thing that fueled you all the time, the anger leaves. Um, you have to do some dealing. And we grabbed our hands with, at the reluctance of one of my sisters who just doesn't like, she doesn't like hospitals. And she's a Leo and she's just like very stubborn. 
<laughs> and she's like, well, y'all go ahead with that. <laughs> I'm like, this is your father. She's like, do y'all go ahead. You know? But we grabbed hands and I said to him as he's unconscious, fly. And I, I know you're heavy. And I know the weights you have been carrying are heavy. Let them go and fly. And he soon after transitioned. Um, I thought I needed to, I, I thought one, I needed him to do something for me. Like I was this little boy still in this grown man's body waiting for his dad to do some reckoning that he never was emotionally, spiritually mature enough to do. And I was waiting for him to get there. Um, but what I discovered was that I had come to an emotional, <laughs> spiritual place where I did not need him to do that for me. Mm -hmm. And was able to release him, not just him, but the anger, the past, the past that chained us together. Um, surprisingly, uh, some time went by and I got a letter from a reader who somehow found my address. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, mm -hmm. It was a long letter, too. I mean, like 20 pages. And um, I didn't read it all. I didn't read it all. And I, and you know, if you're listening, thank you for the letter. Um, <laughs> Because the, it, the first page talked about, said, you know, she, she's a spiritual, she described herself as a spiritualist, and um, she said that you thought your relationship with your father ended at death, but it's actually just beginning. And I read that, and I said, well, I, I didn't read the rest, because I said, if you talk to him, I don't need to know what y'all said. If talk to <laughs> so I'm not reading the rest of that, but... <laughs> I promise you I haven't picked that letter back up. But <laughs> I did take the message to say that um, our healing, my healing, mm -hmm. is beginning now. And that was um, what I sat with. I'm a very, I'm so grateful. I, I would have written a different book. Um, and mm -hmm. I would have characterized him in a different way that did not honor his human complexity. Um, had I written this, had he, had he been alive um, before I finished it. Mm -hmm. mm. One thing you said after that story in the book is you said what you told him to fly, that whatever ever weighed him, the weights he'd been carrying, he could fly. They, they, yeah, I told him what I had learned to do in his absence. Yeah. But it was you, you had that. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. I think... Um, I heard you in an interview somewhere else where you're talking about just the complexity of masculinity. And I mean, that is really something. That's one of these places where you um, are very self-searching. This discipline that you talk about that we all have to have, especially those of us on, you know, who want to be on the side of justice and righteousness, have to constantly be, have to have a critical self-reflection. And... Um, there's a place in the book where you say something like, um, with all of my queer magic, that you realize you'd, you'd still had some, you had privileges of masculinity. Absolutely. In terms of how you were treated differently from your sisters and how mothers are with sons and, and women are with men. Um, so somebody was asking you, or I, I don't know what the question was, but it, you, this is what you said, which I just, I'd like for you to reflect on kind of as we, as we close rather than asking the question, what might it mean to be a freer and better man? What might it mean to be a freer human being? Um, great way to, um, to end, particularly because this is what I'm, my second book is going to be about. Plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I... I I started, you know, we talk about toxic masculinity right now, and um, it's a thing, it's a hashtag, and it's something that we employ everywhere we go. Um, and I often remind people to ask what it is that they're trying to get at by naming toxic masculinity as a thing. So a range of a set of behaviors, practices, ideas. And then I go, well, is, are those behaviors toxic or is it the idea that we create all of us together socially, a, a box, um, a sort of script that is called masculinity, our manhood. You, all, you know, we create these. You do all know that, yes? And, and I started to think, well, 
isn't it the fact that we create these things um, as one size fit all frames that people are supposed to sort of figure out how to be big in? Toxic? Is not the idea, these ideas that we socially, collectively, somehow choose, um, or force people to follow, socialize people into, are not those things? The, the things that we need to challenge. And so therefore, I, oft, I think of gender in many ways, masculinity, this, this notion of manhood, as a cage for many people, as a too small box that does not allow for people to be hum, full so human So many beings. of our boxes, and we have so many boxes. Right? Yeah. So I am interested now, like I tell, I don't, I don't wanna become a better man because y'all you all know what, what I've been told manhood is, it's not anything I'm trying to aspire to. I want to become a better human person. And if we can help people sort of journey to that place, we might find ourselves um, holding on to the keys that can unlock the cages that are keeping so many of us who have been identified, or identify as men, are socialized into manhood. Um, freedom might be on the other side of that. So, you know, I talk about unbecoming. Mm -hmm. Not becoming a man, but what it might mean to unbecome are failing at this project, this cage, these ideas of manhood that have been um, sort of mapped onto us. I think to me that we, that is where our freedom lies. Thank you. Thank Darnell. you. Thank you so much. Darnell Moore.